Hey everybody, uh, this is the third and final video I'm making on a series of odd DreamWorks films that came out when I was a kid. This time we're talking about B-Movie. You know, of the films we've talked about so far in these videos, B-Movie is far and away my favorite. Like, for the first time in a while, it felt like DreamWorks actually cared about being good and endearing and funny. I mean, there's jokes in the movie that genuinely make me laugh a lot, and that's refreshing, honestly. Uh, TiVo. You can just freeze live TV? That's insane. What, you don't have anything like that? We have HiVo, but it's a disease. It's a horrible, horrible disease. Oh my. What's more, as the conclusion of this rough trilogy, B-Movie says some incredibly interesting things, and works surprisingly well as a thematic end to the series. So, that's what we'll be talking about today. B-Movie. Cool. Part 1. The Hive. So, looking at B-Movie as a part of this set of DreamWorks films, it's genuinely shocking how well it fits in with them thematically, how it does exactly what we'd expect it to do. I mean, I don't want to dive too deep into Shark Tale or Over the Hedge because I already made videos about them, but if we really simplify these movies, we can boil them down to one idea. There is a moral tension between hierarchy and the attainment of pleasure. Like, Oscar from Shark Tale wants to be famous and successful, but feels constrained by a rigid society that keeps him oppressed with sharks and poverty. This group of animals from Over the Hedge wants to get food and live and be comfortable. But to do this, they have to go against a social order, invade the more powerful human society. And in the end, both films come to the same conclusion. The imposed hierarchies that our main characters have to deal with are actually not so bad. As it turns out, Oscar doesn't really want to be successful or famous. He wants to do manual labor at the whale wash, and that's the very thing society was telling him to do all along. As it turns out, these animals don't need to go over the hedge. Even though it's their only way of getting food, it's probably best that they not do it. Again, they do the thing that power wants them to do. Within these films, the message is clear. In order to attain pleasure, one should accept existing, often violently imposed, hierarchies. It is only by realizing that the status quo is just that these guys can finally be happy. Okay, that was probably boring to the people who saw my first two videos, but I think it's important because, in the broad strokes, that's B-Movie. I mean, as we step into the film, we are once again introduced to a society defined by strict and unyielding hierarchy. The majority of bees are the working class, interchangeable and disposable cogs who have to spend their lives producing honey for the hive. The minority of bees are the lucky chads who get all the ladies and get to explore the outside world. Once again, our protagonist, Barry, finds himself at odds with this hierarchy. He wants to have fun and be a Chad, but he's not supposed to, because he wasn't born for that life. You know, Dad, the more I think about it, maybe the honey field just isn't right for me. And you were thinking of what? Making balloon animals? And once again, the protagonist resists this social structure until he realizes that the hierarchy was kinda good all along. At the end of the movie, after Barry makes the worlds of bees a post-scarcity utopia, one where there is enough honey that nobody is forced to work, a number of problems come up. For one, bees no longer making honey means no more pollinated flowers, and that's a disaster. But more importantly, we have this scene that occurs toward the end of the movie, probably the most important moment in the whole thing. That's Barry's friend Adam, by the way. At least we got our honey back. Yeah, but sometimes I think, so what if the humans liked our honey? Who wouldn't? It's the greatest thing in the world. I was excited to be a part of making it. This was my new desk. This was my new job. I wanted to do it really well. And now... Now I can't. So, there we have it, folks. Loud and clear. 
It was bad for Barry to disrupt the way social structures work to attain pleasure, because pleasure, at the end of the day, is a product of those structures. The hive, the way it demands labor and forces hierarchy, that is the secret to happiness. And any character who tries to challenge that order to make things better is making a mistake. And now... now I can't. So cool, I guess. We've done our little interpretation of B-Movie. Ultimately, it's pretty thematically similar to the other two movies we've talked about, says a lot of the same things that they do. And I guess we're left with a question here. Are we good with this? If I rounded out this interpretation for a few more minutes, would we be happy with this video? Honestly, I wouldn't be, and I'll tell you why. It feels too easy. It feels cheap. I mean, with Over the Hedge and Shark Tale, sure, they had this message, but it was always intricately delivered, baked in subtext, easy to miss. In B-Movie, though, a character just comes out and says it. Restrictive hierarchy good, transgressive behavior bad. It's just on the plate staring at us. And when you see something like that, it doesn't feel like an opportunity to stop, but to keep going. To try to figure out what's really going on here. And luckily for us, B-Movie is a kinda brilliant film. And when we look more closely at it, we can see that it works not as some embrace of this ideology, but as a critique. A critique of hierarchy, and a critique of what DreamWorks had become. Part 2. The Other Hive. Society. In an early scene in the movie, Barry ventures out of the hive with some of the bee chads, and one of the big boys tells him the most important rule of bee exploring. Don't talk to people. And a reminder for all you rookies, bee law number one, absolutely no talking to humans! This is something that an audience of these movies should be very used to at this point. Within the DreamWorks trash era, communication between different animal classes has always been strained. In Shark Tale, it was aberrant and looked down on. In Over the Hedge, it was impossible. So, watching B-Movie, there's an intuitive sense that we don't need some big explanation for why bees don't talk to people. That's just how things work here. But then, something weird happens. Barry talks to a person, and it's fine. And it's not fine at the end, after the conflict of the film has been resolved. It's fine immediately. Barry talks to Renee Zellweger, and she's confused, but not that confused. And she's nice to him, and offers him cake. Hey, you want a little rum cake? I really Have shouldn't. a little rum no, cake. No, 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 I can't. Oh, come on. You know, I'm trying to lose a couple micrograms here. Where? And, well, these stripes don't help. You look great! I don't know if you know anything about fashion. <laughs> I sincerely find that really cool, because here, we develop a new kind of relationship to this world. Like, humans are on top in this society, and bees are on the bottom. They steal honey and use bees as slaves. And there's a set of behaviors that the bees think they should have when they interact with the human world. Don't talk to them. Don't let them know they're sentient. But now, those assumptions are thrown out the window. There was no good reason why bees shouldn't talk to people. It was actually a pretty good idea for Barry to do that. And so we realize the hierarchy between bees and humans is totally artificial. It is born of a set of ideas that have no basis in reality, that bees live by for some arbitrary reason that nobody explains, that maybe nobody can explain. This is a movie where ideas about how things should work can be proven wrong in an instant. And this little moment can tell us a lot about B-Movie. Because on one hand, we have this hive plot, a story that affirms the importance of artificial hierarchy, and which rejects the idea that we ought to change things. But on the other, 
We have this people plot, the interactions between Barry and the human world, and that plot is just filled with all these little chaotic moments that don't outright challenge social structures, but which do express a certain apathy for them, a resistance to understanding them as this logical, important thing. And let me just give two examples of that. First, let's look at what is probably the most iconic scene in the film, where a bunch of beekeepers talk about their work. <laughs> Couple breaths of this knocks them right out. <laughs> they make the honey, and we make the money. They make the honey, and we make the money? They make the honey, we make the money. That's an amazing line, because it seems to reach through the screen and tell the audience, this movie doesn't care about maintaining some coherent relationship between bees and people. Like, the whole point was that humans didn't know bees could talk, right? That unbeknownst to them, they were exploiting creatures who have total sentience. And because they're not supposed to know about the secret worlds of bees, these guys should probably act like normal beekeepers act. People doing a job. But here... That's not what happens. These men are explicitly malevolent, talking in a way that makes it clear that they know they're using slave labor, treating what amounts to people as instruments in their little honey scheme. So how do people see bees at the beginning of this movie? As insects, like we see them in real life, or as human slaves? Well, the movie doesn't tell us, doesn't give us that reliable world. Whatever hierarchy there is between humans and bees, it is not one that follows a consistent set of rules. Second, let's look at this lengthy scene where this buff boy tries to kill Barry. You know, I just about had it with your little mind games. What's that? Italian Vogue. Mamma mia, that's a lot of pages. It's a lot of ads. Looking at this, it almost feels like it's ripped out of Over the Hedge or Shark Tale. The large, predatory creature exerting power over a smaller one, treating it as lesser, unimportant. It looks like another reminder that ultimately, humans are on top here. But within the context of the film, that is not at all what's going on here. Really, this muscle baby is not powerful at all. Rather, he's clinging to a sense of power that has already escaped him. This bee is cucking him. He's like getting with his girlfriend and inserting himself into his life. And this guy just wants so desperately to return to a time when things could be simple and his relationships were in his control. I didn't want all this to go to waste, so I called Barry. Luckily, he was free. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that was lucky. So, even though he's aggressing against Barry, Barry is winning. What's more, this entire fight scene is played as a huge joke. Even if someone is trying to murder someone else, nobody really seems to care very much. Barry laughs it off, his new human GF scolds the Fit King, the big ham runs out in a little huff. Talking bees, no yogurt night, my nerves are fried from riding on this emotional roller coaster. Goodbye, Ken. Oh! The whole thing works to remind us that even though this looks like a serious scene, looks like a moment of hierarchy in action, it's actually just silly, kind of irrelevant, not something the movie devotes a lot of energy to maintaining. But okay. We can go through bits and pieces of obscure evidence in the film, and that is a really good time, for me at least. But when we just look at the plot of B-Movie, this critique of hierarchy comes into much clearer focus. To recap the film a bit, after Barry leaves the hive and goes off on his own, he stumbles onto a honey farm. And seeing the terrible conditions that the bees live under, he decides to levy a lawsuit against Big Honey to seek the liberation of all bees. Unfortunately, there are some people in this room who think they can take whatever they want from us because we're the little guys. And what I'm hoping is that after this is all over, you'll see how by taking our honey, you're not only taking away everything we have, but everything we are! That's basically the second act of the film. And this may seem like a pretty normal plot, right? 
but it's not. It's super weird and interesting within the context of the films we've been discussing. And to tell you why that is, I have to, one more time, start at the very beginning of our series. Start with Shrek. So, looking at Shrek, a sort of obvious observation about the film is that Shrek, the character, is only ever motivated by the desire to attain happiness. When Lord Duloc ghettoizes the fairy tale creatures, Shrek doesn't care about that injustice for some altruistic reason. Rather, he just wants to get his land back. I'm already on a quest! A quest to get my swamp back! Your swamp? Yeah! My swamp! Where you dump those fairy tale creatures! And while Shrek changes and matures over the course of the film, his motivation doesn't really change. Shrek never cares about fighting evil, about disrupting an unfair system. He just wants the good in life, and has to learn what that means. Now, to be clear, I'm not saying this as a dig against the movie. I think it's pretty cool and realistic. Like, when society deprives someone, others them, and treats them as lesser, it's only natural to personally want to escape that. And the message of Shrek, something I agree with, is that when a socially deviant person pursues pleasure, that pursuit can be a form of transgression. The idea here is that the world of Duloc, of outcasting and mistreating fairy tale creatures, can't meaningfully coexist with Shrek having what he wants in life. And so the story of him gaining happiness is also the story of society getting better. Now, that's super powerful to me. I love that. But here's the thing. There's something a little uncomfortable about it, isn't there? Like, when you tell a story about a protagonist who wants to be happy, then the story ends when the protagonist gets happy. And because of that, none of the great things that happened in the film, the freedom of these fairy tale creatures, the death of Farquaad, none of that had to happen for the primary conflict of the story to resolve. I don't know, maybe Shrek could have gotten happy some other way. Maybe he could have learned to love the ghetto, make friends with the other fairy tale creatures. And that is a disconcerting thought. And this is the discomfort that gets exploited by Shark Tale and Over the Hedge. These films are, unapologetically, about terrible, unfair societies. About overclasses predating on the weak. About characters not having what they need to live. About cultures that lower people and make them feel worthless. But within these stories, none of that stuff actually has to change. The protagonists want to get happy, and they find a way to achieve that with the hands they've been dealt. That's it. The world of these films may not be perfect, but in the end, who cares? They're perfect enough for these boys. So B-Movie just marches in, looks at that, and is like, wow, that blows. Because, sure, Barry does want to gain personal pleasure, wants to escape the rigid structure of his hive, but that conflict gets resolved in around 20 minutes of screen time. The protagonist goes off, establishes a weird relationship with this woman, lives in relative freedom and comfort. He's good. And after that, the focus of the film totally changes. The second Barry sees the conditions under which these slave bees live, he's no longer working for himself. He's not even working for his hive. No, he's working for his people, for liberation. And I think there's something delightfully uncompromising about that. Because there is no turning back from this story. No way for Barry to find out that slave labor is actually fine because he can find happiness as a slave. It's either the bees are free or they're not, and Barry fights for them and succeeds and makes the world better because that's what he wants to do. In Barry, for the first time in this series, we have a revolutionary. And now, considering this, 
Let's revisit the scene that I said was really important a few minutes ago, where Adam laments Barry's lawsuit against people because he's sad that bees will no longer have to produce honey. At least we got our honey back. Yeah, but sometimes I think, so what if the humans liked our honey? Who wouldn't? It's the greatest thing in the world. I was excited to be a part of making it. This was my new desk. This was my new job. I wanted to do it really well. And now... Now I can't. Now, on one hand, yes. This very clearly affirms the social structures of the film. The idea here is that compulsory labor is secretly a good thing, and that Barry is depriving his fellow bee of that forced goodness. But, on the other, what is this guy even talking about? Like, it makes no sense from any perspective. Barry, in this lawsuit, was fighting on behalf of bees who lived in actual slavery. Corporations owned them and treated them terribly. And Adam, Barry's best friend, was never affected by this sort of oppression. He never lived on a honey farm. So his saying, ugh, sure was great before, right? before the lawsuit, that's not just silly, it's also deeply malignant and confusing. He is favoring his status quo, his precious hierarchy, over a huge number of people not being tortured. And, you know, I would write this off as just a bit of cinematic weirdness, the film not understanding the meaning of its own content, but the truth is, the film agrees with my assessment here. In this scene, it might look like Adam is speaking some deep, important truth, but by the end of the story, Nothing he says carries any weight. Bees still make honey and pollinate flowers, but they do so because they want to, not out of some forced arrangement that comes from on high. The bees on the honey farms are still free. Barry doesn't go back to live on the hive. He likes living with people. And in the last scene, we see that he's still fighting the good fight, taking on a case to liberate cows from human ownership. In some strange sense, I think we can see Adam here as a representative of Shark Tale and Over the Hedge. That fear of change, that commitment to the idea that artificial hierarchies are good, and that we can only find happiness within them. But he's wrong. The world of bees gets better because they wanted to change it. There is no going back, and that's a good thing. Part 3. Conclusion. You know, writing that sentence, there is no going back, it kind of made me sad, because it's true in more ways than one. I think that B-Movie was so self-aware, so fundamentally rejecting of its predecessors, that DreamWorks never could go back. B-Movie used all these well-worn tropes, the hierarchy defined by species difference, the rigid culture, the protagonist who breaks the mold, and it used those things to say something genuinely and unexpectedly subversive. When you do that, you can't just make Shark Tale again. You can't just reproduce the very lineage that you just rejected, or at least it would be really weird to do that. And on some level, that kinda sucks, right? I loved making these videos. There's something so crunchy about this era of DreamWorks movies, like they're filled with all these secret meanings and political implications. And I like DreamWorks' newer stuff too, Kung Fu Panda and How to Train Your Dragon, but I like them in the way I like a competent film. They're good, fun to watch, simple. And that change in DreamWorks is probably for the best, right? Watching RJ from Over the Hedge learn the value of social segregation is fun once, but it gets old and I can't keep making the same video forever. All this to say, this was fun. I had a great time with these films. But it's a good thing that the trash era of DreamWorks came to an end and I can't imagine a better conclusion to the series. So, that was that. That's my... that's the end. 
Uh, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe if you like my videos, and be sure to give me money on Patreon if you want to. I make a silly bonus video every month, and I think it's super fun. Uh, and speaking of patrons, it's time for my Patreon question of the video. Amanda asks, Do any of your family members slash friends know about your YouTube channel? What do they think of your content? Yeah, they all know I make YouTube videos. That would get hard to conceal real quick, as they would just come to believe that I was severely unemployed. Uh, I think they like it. I think they do. I think they think... I, I don't know. Maybe they're just nice to me, but they say they like it. Okay, that was the answer to that question. Bye. Woo!